بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله How many of you would like to be with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم in Jannah? الحمد لله The answer is clear to all of us but remember your answer inshallah as we go through the lecture Tonight inshallah ta'ala we're going to mention eight ways eight ways and eight things that if we do them inshallah ta'ala we will be with our beloved prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in jannah may allah make us all from them ya rabbil alameen one night rabia ibn ka'b al-aslami radiyallahu an he has spent the night with the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he used to serve the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so he came to the prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam with some water for his wudu and the prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam asked him sell ask ask for anything you want imagine if you were put into that position where you could ask our beloved prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam anything that you wanted and you know that his dua inshallah ta'ala is going to be answered what would it be that you would ask? And look what Rabi'a radiallahu anhu asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He said, As'aluka murafaqataka fil jannah. He said, I ask that I will be with you in the, in the jannah. That I will be in your company in paradise. And the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam then asked him, Is that it? Is there anything else you want? And he said, that's all I want. He could have started adding other things as well. But his main objective from this life and the main thing that he wants in the hereafter is to be with the Prophet Sallallahu in Jannah. The Prophet والسلام, wanted to teach Rabi'ah a very important lesson. And he wanted to teach his entire ummah the same lesson. He said to him, he didn't say, I'll ask this and it's, it's over. He said to him, فَأَعِنِّي عَلَى نَفْسِكَ بِكَثْرَةِ السُّجُودِ He said, then help me to achieve this for you by devoting yourself to often be in prostration, to pray a lot, to focus on your prayer, to constantly be in prayer. To devote yourself to your prayer. So help me to achieve this for you by devoting yourself often to the prostration. Always be in the sujood. Always be in the prayer. And we look into this hadith. There are two main lessons being taught to us. The first one is very clear. The second one you might need to think about a bit. What is the first lesson? The importance of being devoted to the salat. I mean, I mean, praying all of the time, praying as much as we can. Focusing on the prayer. Not just the fard, but to increase as well, to pray as much as we can. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, to devote yourself, meaning that you're, you're constantly doing, you're praying a lot. So this shows us the importance of the prayer and praying as much as we can. But there's another lesson as well, which you might need to think about a bit. And that is, that Islam... For us to be successful as Muslims, it's not just about wanting something and having the desire for something, but if we want it, we have to work for it. You see it very clearly. The person says, he then, he said, then help me. Help me help you by devoting yourself to the sujood. If you really want it, you have to strive for it. I'm going to make the dua for you, but the dua is not going to be enough unless you really strive for it. And that's why we look into this meaning throughout the Quran. Many examples of this. Every Muslim, if you were to ask them, what do you want from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I want Allah to forgive me, and I want to enter into the Jannah. If that's what you really want, what do you have to do to get it? Allah told us in Surah Ali Imran, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ 
that if you really want the Jannah, Allah said, then hasten, race for it. Race to the maghfirah, to the forgiveness of your Lord into the Jannah. Strive for it, race for it. Work hard for it. And even in another example in Surah Al-Baqarah, and this ayah is amazing, subhanAllah, when you reflect on its meaning. Everyone says that they want to obtain the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the rahmah of Allah. In verse 218 in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَالَّذِينَ هَاجَرُوا وَجَاهَدُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أُولَٰئِكَ يَرْجُونَ رَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ that indeed those who have believed and those who have migrated and those who have fought in the cause of Allah, these are the ones who have the hope. They have the hope, the raja, for the rahmah, for the mercy of Allah. And in return, wallahu ghafoor rahim, and Allah, He is the all-forgiving, the all-merciful subhanahu wa ta'ala. The scholars, when they talked about this verse, they said, after Allah mentioned the iman, he mentioned two of the most difficult actions. He mentioned two of the most difficult actions, and that is for someone to migrate from his country, and secondly, for him to fight in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You leave your homeland, you leave your loved ones, that's difficult. You go out and you fight, you might not come back alive. That's difficult. So these are two of the most difficult actions. But look how Allah said at the end, فَأُولَٰئِكَ يَرْجُونَ رَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ These are the ones who have the hope for the mercy of Allah, to obtain the mercy, the ones who strive and those who work for it. When you talk about constantly praying and devoting yourself to the prayer, what are the main prayers that we need to focus on if we want to achieve this hadith? Because it's one of the ways to Jannah now. One of the ways to Jannah, to be with the Prophet ﷺ in the Jannah is to devote ourselves to the prayers. So what are the main prayers that we need to focus on, inshallah ta'ala? We start with the fard, obviously. The fard is the key thing and the most important thing. And the fard, where should it be prayed? In the masjid, in the jama'ah, in the congregation. If you want to be from those individuals, we focus on make sure, make sure that the salat is correct. That we devote ourselves to the salat by focusing on it. Focusing on its meanings, contemplating, trying to obtain the khushur, praying in the congregation in the jama'ah with the Muslims in the masjid. And after we accomplish that, we go to the next level, which is what? The sunnah prayers in general. The sunnah prayers in general and the most beloved prayer from the sunnah prayers after the fard, what is it? The night prayer. The night prayer. The qiyam al-layl, as it came in the hadith of the Prophet is the most beloved prayer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after the Fard prayer. In one hadith, it was mentioned the Salat al-Fajr in Jama'ah as well on Friday. It also has a high status, that particular prayer. So this is the most beloved prayer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the night prayer. After that, and especially when it comes to the witr, focus on that, make sure that we pray the witr every single night. If you're not going to get up during the night, then you start to pray it before you go to sleep at night. You pray it after Isha if you have to. And once you get yourself into being used to praying it, then you can start to pray during the night if your iman becomes stronger, inshallah ta'ala. So we focus on the witr, and then we focus on the 12 rakats of the rawatib, the sunnah ratiba. What are the 12 rakats of the sunnah ratiba? Two before fajr, four before dhur, two after dhur, two after maghrib, and two after isha. These are the 12 rakats. If you pray them every day, what do you get, inshallah ta'ala, in return? A house in the jannah. SubhanAllah, what a great reward. And many of us, wallahi, we don't take the time to do it. And we don't focus on these prayers. The main prayer that we need to focus on from the 12 is what? The Sunnah of Fajr. The Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam said about it, خَيْرُ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا وَمَا فِيهَا It's better than all of the dunya and all that's in it. But yet many of us, even from our good brothers, the ones who pray Fajr, and sometimes even in the Jama'ah, in the congregation, they're negligent when it comes to the two Sunnahs of Fajr, and they don't pray it. It's a super high status. Better than the dunya and all that's in it. And then after that, 
if we want to increase, we add the Salat of the Awabin. The Salat of the Awabin who are the off repenting, the ones who are constantly repenting. What is this Salat? Salat al duha The Salat of al duha The one that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prayed and he prescribed to the Sahaba like Abu Huraira radiallahu and to focus on praying the duha Whether it be two rakats or whether it be four rakats or more, pray as much as you can. Get yourself accustomed to praying this. Many great rewards in Salat al duha As a homework tonight, inshallah ta'ala, go home and reflect on the rewards you get for Salat al duha It's not just what we mentioned. Many hadith mention the great virtues of praying Salat al duha And then after that, if you want to add more and more just general voluntary prayers, you want to come and you want to add something like the two rakats that Bilal radiallahu an used to pray. And because of these two rakats, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard his footsteps in the Jannah. What are these two rakats? The two rakats of wudu. After you make your wudu, Bismillah, you get up and you, Allah Akbar, you pray two rakats. There's another sunnah. We can add this. So help me help you, the Prophet ﷺ said, by devoting yourself to the prayer. And this is how we devote ourselves. Focus on the fard and then on these nawafils. The second way, and the second thing that's going to help us to be able to be with our beloved Prophet ﷺ in the Jannah is by obeying the Prophet ﷺ. By following and obeying the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ibn Abbas Radiallahu Anhu narrated that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a man came to him and said that I love you so much, Ya Rasulullah, that I constantly remember you. I constantly remember you so much so that I have to come and see you. He said, but then when I come and see you, he said, I feel that like my soul is going to come out of my body. He feels something very tragic. Why is that? He said, because I remember that in the hereafter, in the Jannah, when you go to the highest levels of the Jannah, and I, if I make it, I'll be in the lower levels of the Jannah, I won't be able to see you. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then he said, and I love to be with you at the same level. He wants to be with the Prophet at the same level of the Jannah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't answer him. He didn't answer uh, this man. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verse, verse 69 in Surah An-Nisa, That whoever obeys Allah and the Messenger, then they will, are the ones who are going to be with those whom Allah has bestowed the favor upon. He called the man back and he read this verse to him as a glad tidings for him. That if you are going to obey Allah and to obey his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then you will be with the prophets and with the the, the siddiqeen also the truth ones and the doers of good you will be with them in the jannah when it comes to following the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam it's something that is wajib it is something which is compulsory upon us the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the famous hadith in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, man at, uh, ummati illa man aba. All of my ummah, all of my ummah will enter into the Jannah except for the one who has refused. When you hear this hadith, what comes to your mind right away? Who would refuse? And it's the same question that came to the mind of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. And they said right away, woman yet by Rasulullah. That'd be somebody who's crazy, right? <laughs> you refuse to go to Jannah. But look at the reply, reply of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, man ata'ani dakhal al-jannah wa man asani faqad aba. That whoever obeys me, he will enter into the Jannah, but whoever disobeys me, then he has refused. You refuse to enter into the Jannah. If you truly want to enter into the Jannah and you truly want to be with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Jannah, then there's no choice except for to obey him Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. Allah told us in Surah An-Nur, in tuti'uhu tahtadu, that if you were to follow him, you will be upon guidance. 
If you want to be upon guidance, you must follow the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. The third thing that we can do, or the third way for us to be with our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam in the Jannah is by loving him alayhi salatu wasalam. By loving Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasalam. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu an, he reported in the hadith, which was narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, that a man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he asked him a question. And he said to him, Mata sa'a? When is the final hour? When is the day of judgment? When is the final hour? Is it an important question? Is it an important question or not, Ikhwan? Knowing when the hour is important. If you could know, it's important, yeah, Khan. And to know it, if we could know that question, alhamdulillah, all of us would, we know what, when we need to be ready and we'd, we'd focus more, knowing exactly when it's going to be. It's important. It's, it's, a, it's a good question. But there's something more important. And there's something more significant. And that came in the question that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked this man. He said to him, وَمَاذَا أَعْدَدْتَ لَهَا what have you done to prepare for it? This is more important. It would be good to know when the hour is. But what's really significant and what's really important is what have you done to prepare for that hour when you're sent forth from your grave to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Look at the reply of this man. He said to him, لا شيء إلا أنني أحب الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم He said nothing. I mean, nothing special. Nothing except the love I have for Allah and for His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet والسلام, said to him, Anta ma'aman ahbabt, that you will be with the one that you love. Allah. You will be with the one that you love. Who narrated this hadith? Who remembers? We said in the beginning. Who is the Sahabi who narrated the hadith? Anas, Anas ibn Malik radiallahu an. Anas, he said, he said radiallahu an, فَمَا فَرِحْنَ بِشَيْءٍ فَرَحَنَا بِقَوْلِ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَنْتَ مَعَ مَنْ أَحْبَبْتِ He said, we never became more happy with anything that we heard more than hearing the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam say that you are with those who you love. And Anas, the narrative of the hadith, he used to say at the end of the hadith, he said, so I love Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم and I love Abu Bakr and I love Umar. And he said, I ask Allah that I will be with them even though my deeds are not equivalent to their deeds. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all from them, Ya Rabbil Alameen. May Allah make us all from those who truly love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and truly love Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhuma. And this shows you that from the aqeedah, from the belief of the sahaba, that loving Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhu is from our iman, from who we are. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the men these were the most beloved men to him. And right away, those who truly follow his sunnah, what did he say? Anas radiallahu an, who's the most beloved people to him? After Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right away, Abu Bakr or Umar. But what does it mean to truly have love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? This is the key question. To truly have love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what does it mean? To follow him. Excellent. To follow him. And Allah made this clear to in the Quran. In Surah Ali Imran. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, <clears throat> Qul, Say to the people of Muhammad, In kuntum tuhibbun Allah, fattabi'uni. Say, O Muhammad, to the people, that if you truly love Allah, then follow me. Follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And look at the rahmah, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his kindness with his creation. Because here, Allah could have just said, فَاتَّبِعُونِي Follow me. Follow, follow the Prophet But then he said, What's gonna, what you're going to get in return when you love the Prophet And when you follow the Prophet when you love Allah and you love the Prophet and you follow him and it shows up in your actions. Allah said, يُحْبِبُكُمْ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ in return, Allah will love you and He will forgive you of your sins. 
and Allah is the ghafoor, the all-forgiving, al-Rahim, the all-merciful, subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you look at the love that people claim to have for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, many, many of the times it's love that is on the tongue. And there could be some in the heart. It could be actually be in the heart. But the one that's going to benefit you, it has to show up in your actions. Look at an example of the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Talib. Did he love the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He loved him more than he loved his own children. Subhanallah. He did more for Islam than most Muslims will ever do for Islam. But did his love benefit him? He's going to be in the hellfire, as the Prophet said. Because he let his desires get the best of him and refused to follow the Prophet. But on the contrary, his son, the son of Abu Talib, Ali, radiallahu an. His love for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam led him to have true iman, and look how that true iman benefited him, and look how it showed up in his actions. When he, at a young age, a young boy, accepted Islam, and started to strive and work for Islam and to serve the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and to serve Islam, how he risked his own life. Time and time again, at the time of the Hijrah, when they were coming to kill the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it was the son of Abu Talib, Ali radiallahu an, who slept in the bed of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, on the front lines in the battlefield, risking his life time and time again to serve Islam. So when someone loves Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he loves Islam, it has to show up in the actions. And that's what we see and the actions of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. The fourth way to be with our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is through having good manners. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said in the hadith, which was narrated in Sunan At-Tirmidhi, إِنَّ مِنْ أَحَبِّكُمْ إِلَيَّ وَأَقْرَبِكُمْ إِلَيَّ مِنِّي مَجْلِسَ الْيَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ أَحَاسِنُكُمْ أَخْلَاقَ that the dearest and closest of you to me on the day of resurrection will be those who are the best in their manners, those who have the best akhlaq, the best behavior. And what's meant by Yawm Al-Qiyamah, as the scholars mentioned in this hadith, means in Jannah. It means in Jannah, not meaning being with him on the day itself, because obviously that's the day when you're going to be questioned, you're going to go through difficulties on that day, Everyone will be questioned for their deeds. But they say what's meant is in, it be with him in the Jannah, inshallah ta'ala. And obviously the ones who follow him and have good manners, they will also be with him at his hope, inshallah ta'ala. And also the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will eventually, as we will show in another hadith, will be from those who will come and he will intercede for them yawm al-qiyamah, inshallah ta'ala, as well through the, the love and the actions they had by following him, alayhi salatu wa salam. When you look at the status of good manners, and we've given khutbahs about this here before, subhanallah, one of the greatest actions in Islam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said about it, إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ لِيُتِمِّمْ مَكَارِمِ الْأَخْلَاقِ That indeed I was sent, sent by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala with the risala, the wahi, the revelation from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to perfect good manners. I was sent to perfect good manners. And he showed us in this hadith, the closest and most dearest to him in the hereafter will be the ones who have the best manners in this dunya. He told us in another hadith that from the most actions that will enter the people into the Jannah, the taqwa of Allah, will husn al-khuluq. Having the taqwa, the consciousness, and the fear of Allah in your life, and having good manners. <coughs> and he said you can reach, in another hadith, that you can reach the level of the sa'im and the qa'im. The one who's fasting during the day and praying throughout the night, you can reach that level with your good manners. Something that has such a high status, a way to be with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Jannah, but yet many of us don't focus on perfecting our good manners. We know how we should be as Muslims, but unfortunately, we don't follow, we don't act upon it. Wallahi, if we were just to act according to the manners of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you would find the people of the world entering into the deen of Allah of Waja. In flocks, they would enter into Islam because they would see the impact of Islam upon us. The manners of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what were they? That of the Qur'an. When Aisha radiallahu anha was asked, 
What was the khuluq? What was the manners of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? It was the Qur'an. The Qur'an is the best way to give da'wah and the best way to give da'wah to, to, to the non-Muslims to teach them about Islam is for it to show up in our actions. For them to see Islam and the impact and the effect Islam has upon us. The fifth way to be with our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Jannah is sponsoring orphans. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam in the famous hadith, he said, Ana wa kafil al yateem fil jannati wa ashara bis sababa wal wusta wa faraja baynahuma. He said that me and the one who sponsored the yateem, the orphan, we will be in jannah like this. He showed his two fingers. The index and middle finger, and he separated a little bit between them. That's how close you're going to be with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Jannah when you sponsor an orphan. Imam Ibn Battal, one of the ones who explained Sahih al-Bukhari, he said, after explain, while he was explaining this hadith, that it should be upon, it's a, he said it's upon every Muslim who hears this hadith to act upon it. To, so he can be with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in Jannah. It's upon every Muslim who hears this hadith to act upon it. So he can be with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Jannah. And what is the best way to sponsor an orphan? Just to give some money each month. Standing order comes out of your account. The best way is to physically do it if you have the ability to do so. To actually bring them into your home and raise them as your own child if you can. This is what the scholars mentioned. This is the highest level of kafala of, of sponsoring the orphan. If you can't do that, then you at least physically help and physically monitor their upbringing. When they need something, you take it to them. When they need to buy, buy something, you take them to the market and buy it. You go and you visit them, you sit with them, you spend time with them. You assist them. This is, what, this is the, the next level. If you can't do that, then at least, inshallah ta'ala, then at least you need to what? Then at least... You need to what? You need to, uh, you can sponsor them monthly by doing it. If you can't do that, then the next level would be to what? To sponsor them monthly by paying something. And alhamdulillah, many of the scholars have mentioned that they fall under this hadith. That they do fall under this hadith, that they will be from those who will be in the Jannah with, with the Prophet ﷺ like that. And what a great feeling, eh, Juan. Those of you who have done it, you know what I'm talking about. When you get that report and you see that the little bit of money that you're giving each month, a couple hundred reals, 50, 50 dollars, 50 euros, not something major. You don't even feel it, it comes out of your account. And you see that, you see the impact that it has upon that yatim and the change that you're making in his life. It's an amazing feeling, Wallah. One of the best feelings that you'll find in this dunya, Wallah. The next or the sixth way to be with our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Jannah is by supporting and taking care of your daughters. By supporting and taking care of your daughters. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the hadith narrated in Sahih Muslim, Man ala jariyatayn, that whoever supports two girls till they attain maturity, and he, and he will come on the day of resurrection like this with the Prophet ﷺ once again, and he went joined between his fingers. The ones who raise his daughters properly, he takes care of them. He looks out for them. And what does this mean? Ah, my dear brothers and sisters, what does this mean to properly take care of your daughters? To show them love, to show them affection. They have, they have good deen, good manners, good deen. This is your responsibility as the father. Is to show them the right, right way and to help them, support them, stay upon the right way. Unfortunately, many of the people They've taken their daughters as ways to Jahannam. Let's, let's, be, let, let's be real. Many of the Ummah, their daughters have become ways to Jahannam for them. Because you see, they don't show them the right way, they don't teach them from a young age. And then when they become older, they don't practice with their hijab, they don't practice their deen, they don't have the manners they're supposed to have, and that's our responsibility as the fathers. Say, so what am I supposed to do? Huh? You're supposed to teach her from a young age, first of all. And then you have to have the authority as the parent after that. It's her freedom to do what she wants to do with hijab. When she leaves your house, yes. But in your house, you're the ones who are responsible. Allah is going to ask you. 
If she decides to take off her hijab once she leaves your house, then that's between her and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what you did, what you did is you did your job by showing her the way. And wallahi, ya khwan, if the women in the household are wearing proper hijab from a young age, the little girl is going to follow and wear the hijab as well. But many of the problems because the mama doesn't wear proper hijab, and then she complains her daughter doesn't wear hijab. Sister, you wear it yourself first. You were the bad example for so long. And that's why she's like she is. So it starts from the young age. And then, wallahi, alhamdulillah, they hold firm to it. And we see even the Muslims in the West where the girl holds firm to the hijab. Everywhere around her, non-Muslims. But yet she sees her mother, she sees her auntie, she sees those around her who know that it's ibadah and they follow in her footsteps. And they're proud to be Muslims wearing their hijab. This is our responsibility. To show them from the young age and to make sure they follow on the path. And whoever does that and supports them, then this will be a way to Jannah and a way to be with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in Jannah inshallah ta'ala. And another narration, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, he mentioned about a way to Jannah, mentioning three daughters. And he also mentioned three sisters. So those who don't have daughters, you have sisters <coughs> supporting them, helping them, advising them, showing them the right way. It's also inshallah ta'ala a way to Jannah. The seventh way to be with the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam in Jannah is through making dua. It's through making dua. We learned this from the hadith in the beginning. The hadith of Rubia radiallahu an when he asked to be with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Jannah. And another hadith which Imam Ahmed narrated rahimahullah ta'ala that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an he was in the masjid praying and he was reading from Surah An-Nisa and the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam entered with Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhumah and when he entered into the masjid, he had finished more than 100 ayah, and then he started to make dua Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an. So the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said as he was making dua, he said, ask and you will be given, ask and you will be given. He's making dua for him that his dua is going to be accepted. He's making dua for him that his dua will be accepted. And then he said, alayhi salatu wasalam, Whoever wants to recite the Qur'an, fresh as it was revealed, then let him recite with the qira'ah of Ibn Um Abd. Let him recite with the recitation of Ibn Um Abd, meaning Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an. You want to have the proper recitation? Go learn it from Ibn Mas'ud. And he made dua for him that his dua would be accepted. The next day, Abu Bakr radiallahu an raced to Ibn Mas'ud to give him the glad tidings. This is what the Prophet said about your qira'ah, your recitation, and this is what he said about your dua. And then he asked him right away, what did you make dua for? He said, I said in my dua, Allahumma inni as'aluka imanan la yartad. I ask you an iman which I will not leave. I will stay firm upon. An iman that I will not leave from. Wa na'iman la yanfad. And the blessings that will not go away from the affairs of the of the deen and the dunya that you have that's when it comes to the affairs of the of the dunya that these affairs that you have the khair you have that it won't go away you always have the khair and the blessings of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then the third thing he said muhammad fi a'la al khulut and to be with muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the highest levels of the eternal jannah this was the dua of Ibn Mas'ud. So if you want to be with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Jannah, then follow the footsteps of the, of the Sahaba and make the dua. Oh Allah, make me be with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Jannah. The last way that we're going to mention inshallah ta'ala, the eighth way, is making the salat and salam upon the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam by supplicating to Allah more often for him and by invoking many blessings upon him alayhi salatu wasalam. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said in the hadith which is, uh, was narrated by uh, Imam al-Tirmidhi, he said, Awla nas bi yawm al-qiyama akhtharuhum alayya salatan. That the ones who have the most right for me on the day of resurrection, in the hereafter, it will be those who supplicate Allah most for me. 
those who make the most salat and salam upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And as we know from the sunnas, starting from now after Maghrib on Thursday until Friday, is to increase our salat was salam upon our beloved Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, to constantly make du'a for him, to constantly say sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is from the adhkar that we need to make daily to show the thanks and the gratitude for the beautiful message of Islam that he brought us alayhi salatu wasalam and all the suffering, all the difficulties that he went through. So this message, the message of peace, the message of tranquility, which brings peace of heart and peace of mind to its followers, and then will bring them to Dar as salam bring them to the place of salam and peace in the Jannah inshallah ta'ala. These are eight ways that if we follow them, if we act upon them, then we will be with our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What's important, my dear brothers and sisters, that we go home tonight and we ask ourselves, from these eight things, some of them, some of us, maybe we have only seven ways. If you don't have daughters or you don't have sisters, that's, it. that's not for you. But at least seven ways for all of us, inshallah ta'ala. To be able to what? Be with our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Jannah. So we need to make a checklist and go through it with ourselves. How am I when it comes to devoting myself to the, to the prayer? Devoting, praying a lot, focusing on my fault, make sure it's as perfect as possible. Then he adding all, all of these nawafil, all these voluntary prayers that I need to add. How am I when it comes to following and obeying the commands of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? How am I when it comes to truly loving the messenger alayhi salatu wa sallam? The true love shows up where? In the actions. And how am I in my manners? Are my manners the manners of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And the fifth way is sponsoring orphans. How many of us have sponsored an orphan? Sometime in our life, how many of us sponsored one right now? If we don't do it, then we go and do it. Alhamdulillah, we can go to one of the malls and you can sponsor an orphan. You can go one of the, to one of the charity organizations and you can sponsor an orphan for the entire year, alhamdulillah. You can give them a, a standing order. It'll come out of your account each month. You won't notice it, but you notice the barakah in your life. And you're going to see how you feel when you get that report from them. This is what your money has done for that orphan. When it comes to raising our daughters, looking out for our daughters, for our sisters, making dua, how, 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 often, do I, how often do I ask to be with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in Jannah? And giving the salatu was salam upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi How am I when it comes to that? How often do I do it? These are the ways that we have to be with our beloved Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Jannah. May Allah make us all from those who strive to do it. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Wallahu ala musallahu sallam mubarak ala nabina Muhammad. Uh, if there's any questions, inshallah ta'ala, we can have some uh, Q&A inshallah as well. No. The brother is asking that we, it's a very good question actually, that if you contribute to an organization which looks after orphans, do you get the same reward? Obviously the scholars when they talked about it, to personally do it, that's what it means to sponsor. Or to personally sponsor a specific orphan, no doubt you fall inshallah ta'ala under the hadith. If it's something general, we say inshallah we hope. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most merciful. Allah knows your niyyah. They said this hadith was said to us by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Therefore, I'm going to donate to this organization which looks after orphans. Then inshallah wa ta'ala, we hope, inshallah, we pray that inshallah they, they would fall under that, that category. Even though it's, it's more general, but inshallah, nonetheless, inshallah wa ta'ala will fall under that category where they will be from those who sponsored an orphan, inshallah wa ta'ala. Allahu alam, man. If, if the, if the non, I mean, obviously the Muslim orphan is clear. A non Muslim orphan, Allahu alam. This I have to look into. There's many organizations out there who look after orphans. And the situation that the Ummah is going through, we have to focus on home base first. Not saying that we don't take care of non Muslim orphans. That's, it's, a, it's a good way in the, uh, to help out as well. But we need to focus on our home base. Especially what's going on, you see what's happening in Yemen, Syria, these places. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for our brothers there, Ya Rabbil Alameen. 
and the calamities they're going through in Burma, all of this. And they need help. They need people who step up, inshallah, and help these orphans and take, uh, take care of them, inshallah ta'ala. Something very, very beautiful that happened to us in, in Ireland. But many Muslims weren't un, un, uh, ready to step up and take the challenge. But the government gave us the opportunity. When there was Syrian orphans that had, had come to Ireland, they said that we're looking for Muslim families to take care of them. Because they said they're coming from a Muslim background, therefore, you know, the ones who should raise them and understand them properly will be Muslims. They don't want to change their faith. They want to help them protect their faith, subhanAllah, and they're not Muslims. So alhamdulillah, that was a very, very good opportunity. But many Muslims, their understanding of sponsoring an orphan is just give a check at the end of the month. But if you bring them into your house and you raise them, that's the, that's the proper way. That's the best way. That's the highest level. And that's when, it, when this, this type of opportunity, when it comes, we need to take it. We need to take it and be able to uh, help these orphans. Imagine if that was your kid and your brothers didn't. Let's always say to the brothers, imagine if that was your child and your brothers didn't step up. That should, that should be the last thing on our mind if we're about to die as Muslims is what's going to happen to our children. Because alhamdulillah, we have these hadith. We know the status of the orphan. We know it's a way to Jannah and a way to be with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Jannah. So you wouldn't think, you wouldn't think for a minute that you, you're not going to have this great reward of being, uh, this great reward of, of people stepping up to take care of your children. So imagine that if your children were sent to a non-Muslim country and the government gave the opportunity to the Muslim community to take care of them and your Muslim brothers didn't step up. SubhanAllah. And what do we say to, you, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala al qiyamah? Allah gave us an easy way to Jannah. And we didn't take it, SubhanAllah. Allah gave us a responsibility and we didn't fulfill it. SubhanAllah. May Allah help us, Ya Rabbi. It's, it's a good question that the, the, the brother's asking. The brothers, the, the ones who are negligent in the prayers, and they want to make them up. Should they do this before the nawafil or not? The opinion that I follow is that with the tawbah, inshallah ta'ala, that's sufficient. And the ones you have to make up, if it's been too much, then inshallah ta'ala to the tawbah, because even there's a difference of opinion. The one who wasn't praying, or was he praying sometimes, was even a Muslim. There's an issue. So if someone was negligent with his prayers and he made tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he properly repented and he properly started to pray. Inshallah ta'ala, my opinion is that's sufficient for him. He does that and then he adds the nawafil and Allah will forgive him, inshallah, what happened in the past. If someone wants to follow the opinion of some of the scholars who say, no, he must make these up, then what he would do in this situation, as some scholars mention, is that every time you pray a fart, you pray a qada. And here you would pray the qada before the sunnah because the qada has more ajr than the sunnah. And then after that, you can add the sunnah if you have the ability to pray all of those, inshallah ta'ala. That's the way you would do it, and Allah knows best.